And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, a man who I think is pretty unique in this day and age in that he has dedicated his entire professional career to just one company. And lucky for us, it's a company that, as much as any in the world, serve as a beacon of innovation and strategic brilliance. After earning his degree from the University of Glasgow, Mr. Tom Johnstone joined SKF in 1977. Since those early days, it has been a steady climb for Tom, all the way up to his appointment in 2003 as president and CEO of ABSKF. Under Tom's leadership, SKF has evolved into a knowledge engineering company, gaining worldwide renown for its outstanding performance and commitment to sustainability. Tom is a director of Chalmers University of Technology and the Association of Sweden Engineering Industries. He's the recipient of the European Six Sigma Leadership Award, the Swedish Royal Order of the Polar Star, and honorary doctorates from the University of South Carolina and Cranfield University. In 2009, he was voted Europe's best CEO in the engineering and machinery sector. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Tom Johnstone. So good morning, everybody. It, uh, Bernard, thank you so much for your kind words, and I feel, I must say, a little bit underdressed. I, I, <laughs> if I'm invited back next time, I bring my kilt, and at least I can stand there with you. Um, it's a great uh, honor and privilege for me to have the opportunity to be here today and to say a few words about what we're doing in the SKF group and how we're developing ourselves to become a knowledge engineering company. As you can tell from my accent, I'm not Swedish. Uh, being Scottish, some people, some people tell me, Tom, you've got a funny accent. I don't think it's that strange or funny there. Yeah. But they say also to me, Tom, sometimes you talk too fast. I say, no, you listen too slow. <laughs> so let's make, a, let's make a, a deal today. I'll try not to talk too fast if you try not to listen too slow. I want to say a few words at the start about SKF, uh, some facts about SKF, because I'm not sure everyone in the room knows about SKF and what we're doing to develop the company just now. I'll then move on and talk about the, the journey we're working on to create value and actually get paid for the value we deliver to our customers. And I'll close it out by the, how we're driving strategic account management within the SKF uh, group in total. So, some facts about the SKF Group. We're a $10 billion corporation. Uh, we have factories in 29 countries, a presence in 130 countries through the world. And very importantly for us, we work a lot with distributors, both industrial distributors and vehicle aftermarket distributors to take our products to market, to take our solutions to market. Roughly 40% of our business goes to the market through distribution. So it's a very important part. And as we're trying to take our technology there, trying to, to bring value to our customers, it's important that we work with our distributors on that journey to help them bring that forward to our, uh, our customers. I said we're a truly global company. And you can see that from when we started back in 1907. We were here in the USA a couple of years later. And if you look at economies which were very much in vogue, the BRIC economies, SKF were present in them very, very early on. And that's been a true factor of SKF. Being started on innovation, we went global extremely quickly. By the time we were 25 years old, we were operating in some 40 countries around the world. Straight from this meeting today, I will leave just after lunch to be in Holland tomorrow morning because tomorrow we have a big meeting and celebrate 100 years in Holland with our customers, with our distributors, and some distinguished guests. So I will go there to, to, to take part in that ceremony. Where do we sell? How does our sales split now, the $10 billion around the world today? Well, 42% of it is in Europe today, roughly 24% in Asia, 
24% in North America, 7% Latin America, then we have Middle East in, in Africa. And that has changed over time. Both uh, Asia and North America has grown for, for us. And what's interesting is when I, when I go down to see the team in Asia, I keep pushing them and say, come on guys, you're, you're not even number two in the group yet there. Europe's number one, you've got to go. You've got to get there. You, you can get ahead of North America. Come on, no problem. Then I go to our team in North America, which I did this week, and I said, come on, you, you can never accept being number two to anybody even. You've got to get bigger in Europe there. So it keeps the competition going, I must say, in a good way. That's where we sell. What do we do in SKF? For most people who they talk about SKF, they talk about us as the bearing company. And yes, we are the world leading bearing company. Many of the major innovations in bearings we have brought to the marketplace over our history. But we've evolved over a number of years to add other technologies to SKF. Our sealing technology, we're not the leader, but we're one of the leading sealing technology companies in the world. Over the last 10 years, we've evolved into the leading automated lubrication system company. Through acquisitions, through a number of acquisitions, we've become the leader in that industry. In mechatronics, everything to do with actuation. For example, if you go into the hospital, and I hope you don't need to, for, for, and you need to go into a scanner, the tables that move, a lot of them use SKF actuation systems. Or fly-by-wire systems on aircraft are developed and provided by SKF. And last but not least, our services. Helping our customers uh, plan their maintenance. Design consultancy services for our customers. And many of the tools that go with them. Over the last 10 years, we've packaged these technologies together in SKF. And why do we do that? We do it to help us manage and reduce energy, friction and weight for our customers. To help them improve performance, productivity and output and help them reduce their total cost. We see all these technologies as, as very complementary. And by bringing them together, we can help our customers develop. Because we want our customers to be more successful, more profitable using our technology. What we do is we invest in innovation in each of these technology areas, but we also invest in innovation across these technology areas. And that means that we are evolving SKF from being a component supplier, coming up Why do we do that? Of course, when we're moving up the value chain. We're moving up the value chain so that we can get a higher reward. But we must remember, as you move up that value chain, you also increase the risk. You also increase the necessity for you to be closer under the skin of your customers to understand what they're doing and what challenges they face. And that means you have to improve your required knowledge. Your knowledge not only of your products, but also of your customers' technologies and that we've been working on. And we call this the three R's of being a knowledge engineering company. When I grew up in Scotland, we used to always push the three R's. You had to be successful in the three R's. Reading, writing, arithmetic. For whoever was doing that, actually, they couldn't spell, but that's another issue uh, there. But these are the three R's of the knowledge engineering company. And that is what we are doing to evolve. And I'll show some examples of that a little bit later on. Where do we sell our technology? Where do we work with? We work with roughly 40 different industries around the world. Some of them I show there. From aircraft to mining, from steel mills to paper mills, to food and beverage companies, to the car industry, to household appliances. And what's interesting about that is all these different industries have different technical challenges, different commercial challenges, and we can use knowledge from one area and apply it in another area. But we're not that well known still, but we're a daily part of everyone's life. Do you know roughly in a household, there's something between 150 to 200 applications of SKF products in a household? In the car, in the power tool, in the lawnmower, in the washing machine, in the fridge compressor. You don't see us, and hopefully you don't hear us. <laughs> if you hear us, we've got a real problem. And that's why we have to continuously work to raise our visibility as SKF. We do many things to do that there. One thing that's our guiding light in SKF, and Bernard mentioned that, 
and that is sustainability. We've embarked many years ago in sustainability as being the guiding light that drives what we do in the business, with the four dimensions. But we've called it SKF Care. And why did we do that? Because we felt that the word sustainability was not easily understood by our employees. It was difficult to translate in languages. It was difficult to make it relevant for someone on the shop floor. But SKF care can be relevant. Business care. Ensure we take care of our customers in the right way. We give the right return to our shareholders. Environment care. Employee care. Community care. I look at these four dimensions as being like the four legs on your seat. All four have to be strong. If they're not strong, you don't sit very comfortable. And we don't sit very comfortable. And that's how we drive the company. So if I look at that and I see the priorities we have, we build them around that. And I'll just look at a couple of these if I could relatively quickly before I go on more to the value area. One of our priorities is, of course, like any company, all of you, how do we get sustainable, profitable growth? How do we drive our business forward? There, we have six initiatives. Firstly, we are investing heavily in our technology platforms, bringing them to our customers, trying to develop new products, solutions, capture more value for our customers. Secondly, we work a lot in the asset life cycle. I'll come back and talk what I mean by that a little bit later on if I could. The Beyond Zero portfolio of products. Our Beyond Zero portfolio of products are how we help our customers reduce their environmental impact by reducing energy consumption, improving fuel efficiency, reducing weight for the products. And I'll talk in a second a few bits on that. Innovation, critical to SKF uh, for us. Bringing new products, bringing new solutions to the marketplace. I'll come back to that as well. It's interesting as well, when you look at the market and you look at customers, we see that we cannot stretch the SKF brand to cover all customers. There are certain market segments where the performance requirements are a little bit different to the performance requirements we have for many of our customers. There we have developed, through acquisition, second brands that operate completely independently. Peer and GBC are two such second brands, the general. They, they are products manufactured in China and taken to the market independently to target segments such as elevators, agricultural equipment, etc. And then last but not least, acquisitions. We've made 24 acquisitions over the last 10 years in SKF in each of our technology platforms, helping us better serve our customers, widening our product portfolio. Let me talk a little bit about the Beyond Zero portfolio, if I could. Here, I, I, I don't expect you to look at all of them, but we've got 40 solutions for our customers for the Beyond Zero portfolio. Today, about $500 million in sales. We will triple that in the next three years. The one at the bottom, the remanufacturing. If, by working with our customers and identifying when we need to remanufacture something, we can dramatically reduce the energy consumed and improve the performance for our customers. Let me move on and talk the second innovation, uh, second area, in investments and innovation. What we're doing there, we're bringing manufacturing closer and closer to our customers. We've opened 14 new factories over the last years, bringing it, technology close to our customer door in America, in East Europe, in Asia. We've invested also bringing our knowledge to our customers. We've built a campus network up in colleges in SKF, five of them around the world. One in Sweden, one in India, one in China, one in the USA, one in Argentina, and we'll soon add a next one. We're investing in technology. We've opened up a new technology center in India, in China, and with two new ones put in, put in place in Europe bringing R&D closer to our customers. Over the last four years, we've increased our spend in the research and development by 60%. We now, we used to register one new patent every second day. Today, we register one patent every single working day. And very soon, we will have one patent every, every calendar day of the year. We're investing in what we call solution factories. With all these technologies, Bringing that knowledge close to our customer and helping create value close to them is important. A solution factory is a knowledge center for SKF. There we do remanufacturing of products, customization, small lot manufacturing, but we have our industry experts there. Each solution factory is unique for the industry it serves. The one in Houston in Texas, of course, 
is the oil industry focus. The one in Perth, Australia, is the mining industry focus. Tomorrow, also in Holland, I'll open a new solution factory there. We're investing in new IT systems in SKF, the biggest single investment we've ever made. The greatest change we'll make in how we can uh, operate our business processes, how we can better serve our customers. Uh, and I it's a huge project for us, but it will make the biggest change we've had in SKF. And then last but not least, and I think there was a session on this yesterday on digitalization there. Heavy investment in bringing our knowledge to our customers using apps. Today, we have 38 apps in SKF, apps that enable the customer to select their own products, help them with tips for installation, etc. And you can see more and more of this coming. I think that will be a huge change as well. So with that, what are we doing from a value viewpoint for our customers? Well, we put these priorities round about to help drive value to our customers. I will not talk so much about cost reduction and capital efficiency here. You know, the first two I talked about, they're the accelerator, the gas pedal. The other one's the brake. You need to have both as you have that in a car. Value. Value comes from putting the customer in focus. Our objective is how can we deliver value to our customers in the most effective and efficient way, but built on a deep understanding of their needs, but also utilizing the knowledge, the strength of our people, the skills of our partners, and the depth of our technology. Let me talk a little bit about what we're doing there. We focus a lot now with our customers on asset life cycle, with the industries in asset life cycle. We reorganized the group a couple of years ago so that we now run in complete customer-focused in industry segments. So we have a marine business, a mining business, a renewable energy business, a car business, a truck business, but looking at both ends looking at how do we work with the manufacturers of equipment for that industry, but also how do we work with the users of these equipment. Let me talk a little bit about the asset life cycle, if I could, and the different dimensions of it. First of all, how can we help our customers design and develop and use our services to help them optimize the design and development of their equipment? How can we help them bring that to the market fix quicker, using our state-of-the-art technologies in modeling and simulation? Thirdly, helping customers install and commission the equipment so it's installed properly and can be used properly. Helping them operate and monitor that equipment as well. Do you know, today, we are monitoring over one million assets for our customers, how they're performing and giving them indications of what's happening to their equipment. And with one of our latest innovations, we have invented a self-powered wireless sensor that can go deep in to equipment and send out signals of what's happening. That, combined with our prognostic software, we're able to pick things up just before they happen and help our customers modify the performance and operation of their equipment there. Then we take it to help them maintain and repair using our service business. We have service engineers at many of our customers' facilities helping them maintain and repair the business. And with all of that then, it comes back into how do we improve the specifications for equipment so that when we go back with the manufacturers, we can help them design and develop better equipment? How do we work with regulatory bodies to make sure that's put into the standards? We're working actively on that asset life cycle. Are we completing it? No, but we're on the journey. And we're seeing many, many different successes. I'll just show one example if I could here. Here, we've been doing a lot in the food and beverage industry to help them improve uptime, to reduce maintenance costs, but also take care of safety and hygiene. Here, we're working with a food manufacturer for chocolate bars on the lubrication of the conveyor system. They wanted to reduce the amount of lubrication, but they also wanted to improve the, the, or, or reduce the risk of contamination into the chocolate bar. By using our special chain room system there, they've been able to achieve that. And it was so successful that when they built their next plant, they specified that. And actually now the OEM manufacturer of that equipment uses that as a standard piece. And that's part of what we do with the asset life cycle. Many times we have challenges in working with OEMs to get them to take the new technologies and understand the value it comes to the customers. They say, but our salespeople can't sell that value. Or we need to help the salespeople sell the value. 
or our customers don't, are not interested in it. By working on the asset life cycle and working with the end users, we can then help show the value, get a product specified there, and bring it around and complete the circle. And we're doing that. That's one example. I could have showed many examples in marine and food and beverage where we've been increasingly successful. But the key to all that is how do you value it? How do you identify the value within this? And we have a value process within SKF. It starts, of course, with the customer. Understanding the challenges, the needs the customer has. Understanding what we need to do to, to meet these needs there. We then look at our technologies and say, with our technologies, how can we meet these needs? But also, how can we take knowledge and technology from other industries and bring that over into this specific industry for the customer? By doing that, we're able to identify products, solutions, services we can take to the market. But then you have to find a way to value that. And that is one of the major challenges always. How do you put a value in it? Because one of the things we see many times when we're working with this value process and we bring it forward to the market is we face this, the price berg. <laughs> no, where the price is very visible to everybody. This is the price of our product or our solution versus someone else. But what's not so visible is all the hidden costs, whatever they may be. All the different hidden costs, whether it's administration, whether it's warehousing, whether it's flexibility in their operations. That is what makes up total cost of ownership. And we all know about total cost of ownership. But the key is how to put a value on that and how to identify the value and how to be able to justify that our solution can do things better. We've developed a tool we call Documented Solutions uh, Program. It's a tool to find value, to measure the expected value, look at prioritizing implementation of that, but then measure the results as well. By implementing it, what result do you get? And what does it do? It helps the customer justify SKF as an investment, the solution as an investment. They can go to their management and say, hey, by using this, I can reduce downtime, I can improve productivity, I can uncover the hidden factory within my factory and avoid a major investment in new equipment. It helps them do that. You know, most people can understand that downtime, they have a value for downtime. If my plant's not working, it costs me X amount per hour. But when you look at all the other hidden costs, how do you value them? This tool helps us do that. It also helps uh, our, sales, our salespeople and their salespeople look at what they can do in the market and how they can take that value to the market. We've been doing this over 10 years, and we built up a fantastic uh, reservoir of information, of knowledge, database of that. We have over 47,000 verified cases in that database. Since we started 10 years ago, we have 4.2 billion US dollars savings. And what, when I talk about these savings, these are savings where the customer has signed off after the event and said, yes, SKF, you saved me that amount of money. It's not what we say, promise at the start or what we see at the start. It's what the customer sees when they follow up the result at the end of it there. And that's important to get that signed off because organizations change in customers. And you're always coming up against the price berg. So getting the documented savings and getting them verified is very important. You know, last year alone, the savings that were signed off by our customers was roughly 6% of our sales. 6% of our sales. I told our suppliers at a meeting recently who were pushing for a price increase, I'll give you a price increase. You give me 6% savings, I'll give you a price increase there. So we get a net total cost out. We're working with that, but how do we bring it to market? How do we make it reality? We have the tools. That's where we've embraced the strategic account management process. And particularly in one part, this is RSS. It means SKF terminology means regional sales and service, headed by Vartan Vartanian, who's here with a number of his colleagues there. And we're using the strategic account way of working to help drive this uh, uh, value the value we deliver to our customers. And these are, I took the customer names away, but we have six global strategic accounts in food and beverage, five in marine, etc. 34 in total in this division. 
And we have more in our other two divisions or business areas, as we call them, as well. At group level, at group management level, also, we follow up a number of strategic accounts. So we have a meeting next week, and we will have the global strategic account manager for that company come to a group management meeting, and we'll have a discussion. What can we do more to help him in working with that strategic account? You know, also, apart from these 34 strategic accounts, there's one other strategic account that Vartan and his team has, and that is SKF. Because his knowledge on maintenance and practice, his team's knowledge, can help us improve the operations in their own factory. And I can tell you, the toughest, the toughest sell they've got is not to marine or food and beverage. You try selling to your own operation. That's the toughest one. I always say to our key account manager, here, he's got the toughest job in the world there. What's the old saying? You can choose your friends, but not your family. <laughs> so he works hard, and we're using it and implementing it more and more in their own operations. What's interesting, I've got to say, is in areas where we've implemented it in our own operations, our business with other customers is developing stronger. Because the best salesperson for us is the maintenance manager of our own factory. So we're running the strategic account process, and actually, we're doing, we're following the textbook. We're following the textbook of how we can drive it. We have a handbook within our operation. This is how we should run the strategic account process in SKF. It looks at how, you, how do you define a strategic account? When should it be a global or a group strategic account? A global for one of our business areas or divisions? A regional strategic account? Or even a country strategic account? There's a selection process to look at that very clearly identified in that handbook. The way we work, how we will work with them, how we will follow things up, how we will communicate with them, and what profile do we need as individuals to be a strategic account manager? Hey, it's textbook stuff. You're doing that as well. The key is not the book. The key is implementing it and driving it all the time. And I've got to say, we still have some way to go. We're in a good way in Barton's area, but we still have some way to go, especially when we have a strategic account. I was talking to someone last evening where we have a, strategic, a, big, a few strategic accounts that go across all of our divisions. And try getting these divisions to cooperate is an interesting challenge for me. But we're moving that way, and we're moving in the right way as well. We follow up what we're doing on, on CBO, CRM. That we, it's a tool, it's a very, very rigid follow-up that we have there, especially Vartan and his team follow up, to make sure that they use the tool to register visits, opportunities, hit rates, to look at the, how we replicate it, how the quality of the information is as well. We're working also actively in these strategic accounts to also follow up and use DSP as the tool to show the value that we deliver to our customers. Because it is important to document it, register it, and have it available all the time when you're working. That's how you capture the value that you're working on there as well. We're great. We're actively participating, Bernard, in your program to train our people. We have people here just now being trained. And I think certifying them is, is a fantastic way, fantastic way to grow and develop their skills uh, there and help us bring that skill more and more into SKF as well. We also train them on asset efficiency, how to really optimize asset efficiency for our customers there. And that's a big program we're driving this year to help us uh, give them the tools they need to do the process and drive it going forward. Within each business area and within the group, we have a strategic account council. Vartan and Corrado Chester is here as well, heads up the, the strategic account council within the, this business area, but also Vartan with his colleagues in other business, divisions, business areas in SKF have their own strategic account council that follow up and try to drive that we've got the same methodology throughout the group in doing it. And that is coming more and more. So I'd say we're on a good way here. We still have a long way to go, but we're on a good way and we're using that as a means to drive and development our business there as well. But the one thing I always push to our organization to remember for all we do in SKF, all our priorities, it starts with the customer. At the end of the day, the customer decides, do we deliver value? We don't decide it. The customer decides the value of the value. What we can do with DSP is use that to show the value, to show best practices 
of value from many industries around the world to, to our customers. And we continue to push and drive uh, and get paid for the value we deliver to our customers because that's important for how we develop and how we develop as a company. So in total, I think we're, we're, we're on a good way in SKF, both in investing in technology and technology that can bring value to our customers, also in investing in our people, especially in strategic account management and the tools that that brings to us, and in the tools like DSP, the Documented Solutions Program, to help us justify the value. These are powerful elements that help us continue to develop SKF going forward. But what's exciting to me is each time I come to meetings like this and I listen to people and talk to people, I go away with a lot more ideas of what we can do. It's a fantastic session to be able to, to learn from one another as to see how we can further improve and take best practice from you. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. It really is a great, great pleasure to be here and to be here in such a special time for Sama. And I'll close by congratulating Sama on your 50th anniversary. Fantastic achievement. And I look forward to watching some of the time and the rest of the time from maybe a beach somewhere for the next 50 years. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for a few questions. Yes? Mr. There's a microphone coming. Have we got that? Yeah. Hi, Mr. Johnson. My name is Sam Ely, Karras Corporation. Um, you mentioned uh, your, your strategic accounts, and there were 34 of them categorized in various groups, food and beverage and everything else. Early in your presentation, you said that 40% of your revenue came from distributors. Yes. How do you, first question is, is do you have any distributors that fall in strategic accounts? And if so, how did you rank distributors and categorize them? And then how do you sell your value through the distributor organization? I, I think you're hitting on one of the, the, the big uh, challenges. First of all, we have our top distributors that we focus on where there are account managers for our top <coughs> distributors. Um, many of our distributors are not the same size as the other big accounts and not so global is the other big accounts, they're much more regional there. So we work a lot with them. We have developed a tool, alongside DSP, we've developed a tool we call DVP, Documented Value Program, for our distributors to use with their customers. They also have tools where they can do early part work on service and service, um, uh, low-end service activities there with us. So we work hand in glove with them to give them the training, the tools for them. To, to work with our customers. We also though recognize that a lot of the selling on, on, on solutions, a lot of the selling on uptime and service, we have to do ourselves with the big end users. So we don't, even though the business goes that way, a lot of the work we have to do and, and, and provide the expertise and knowledge to work with our distributors. It, 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 it's interesting if I take distribution, if I go back 10 years ago, distribution was something like 32, 33% of SKF, now it's nearly 40, 39, 40% of SKF, and SKF is 50% bigger. So it shows we've invested a lot into our distributors to help train, develop them. We have a distributor college, an online distributor college for our distributors to learn uh, how they can do many things, from simple things, how you set up and run a distributor, through product knowledge, through uh, sales area planning, financial management, etc that we do, and I think we've just done the 200,000 certificate of I remember from there. From the, from, we, we, we follow up the, the number of certificates, and it's really, it's gone like that, uh, there, the number of certificates we're, we're issuing. And that's a way to bring our knowledge to our distributors and help them develop their business. But distribution, in my opinion, is going through a big change in the industrial arena, and with many challenges, with the internet coming, with different types of players uh, in there. And so therefore, th they have to continue to evolve as well to be able to deliver value to the customers and show that they have a valuable part of the total value chain, or they have an important part of the total value chain. Okay, other questions? There's one, one here first, I think there's one over the back as well. Yeah, hi. 
Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Morning. Jan Anmore with Hilton Worldwide. You mentioned how, it, from your role, that it's somewhat difficult to engage the SAM culture within your organization. Can you address maybe a couple of those barriers and how you are trying to overcome them within that yeah. arena? You know, the, the area that, driven, that, that drove uh, the strategic account management much more was the area I highlighted, the RSS. Um, we've been bringing it into the other areas. Uh, two of the big challenges that we face. One is when we have a strategic account that goes across different business divisions and different areas there, because, I'll go back to that, we drive a lot of accountability and responsibility in organization. So we put it down and say, you're responsible and accountable for your business and can drive your business. Um, when you have that, but then you get a strategic account that goes across the other ones, uh, many businesses, uh, sometimes you have to optimize what's right for the strategic account that may sub-optimize what's right for one of the businesses there. And the way we do that now, and the way we're trying to do it now, is to bring it up on group management level, so we do it at the group management meetings. So we sit there and we, uh, uh, we will look at some of the accounts and see how we can address it. I've got to be honest, are we perfect? No, we still have some way to go, we still have some challenges, but we're, we're grappling with the problem. So if any of you in here have got the, the magic bullet for that there, I will, I will take it, not to shoot someone, but, to, <laughs> but to, to hopefully use it there as well. That's one challenge uh, which I think is uh, important. The second one also is many of our strategic accounts have the responsibility for, for a global customer but that customer has operations in many countries around the world, and you're trying to get the same dedication and support for that customer in Portugal as you have for that customer who's headquartered in America or, or, or Germany, and, and working that, uh, uh, to get that support there, and for them in that market to see it as important, because that customer expects the same level of technical support and service whether it's here or here in the world. Uh, there. The way to do that is the whole handbook, the process to look at that, prioritize the customers, and for them to know that Vartan or our senior managers are looking at that and following it up there as well. Welcome. Other questions? Yes, good morning. Yeah, I hear uh, you, but I can't see you, so just speak, I, just yes. speak. I, uh, I thought it was very interesting in your presentation, you talked about sustainability and you really transformed it into four different areas of SKF cares. Mm. It seemed like maybe that was for also global communication and so it would translate to different cultures. Mm. And then you mentioned that you wrapped your, your business model around those yep. sustainability efforts. I was wondering if you could give us just a little bit more detail um, around that piece of it, that aspect of it. Sure, sure. You know, our product, if you look at sustainability, for us, as I said, is a difficult word, but also in many times has been hijacked into only being environmental care. And it is many more dimensions. So when we were looking to drive sustainability, we felt it was important to make it easily understood by everybody. And really to, to, to put programs and activities together against all the different d dimensions. The key to us in and, and why we drove it that way is that we saw that as not being something we should do because we were getting pushed by a government to do it or by an NGO to do it or but for reporting to do it, but to say if you can fully integrate that into your business and see it as a business opportunity, not as something you're doing because you're being forced to do it, then you can um, use it as a competitive advantage. But to do that, you have to make it understandable with your people. And that's what we did with doing, calling it SKF Care. And we follow up each of the different areas there. If you don't integrate it into your business, it will be a cost. And every time you run into difficulties, you will cut costs. And that will be one of the areas that you cut. So we integrated it to make it a, 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 an important part of our business model, an important part of our business, business culture. And I'm proud that in 2009, when we faced the biggest downturn we faced in our business in a long time, 2009, we reduced production worldwide by one third. Our sales went down by 24% in volume, but we never pulled back at all in our commitment in employee care, our commitment in environment care, or our commitment in community care. Because if we had done that, I could never go back the year later, 
two years later and reinstate it, because then it would be seen as flavor of the month there. So to me, integrate it into your business. Don't, you, we have a separate specialist area that looks at it, but it should not be run by specialists. It has to be owned by the operations, and by doing that, you will help develop it. And the four dimensions are common dimensions in sustainability, but as I say, many times community, oh, sorry, environment care has been taken over a little bit in that. The beyond zero, I could just mention that briefly, the beyond zero part is our strategy for the climate change. It's the portfolio I mentioned of solutions for our customers, but on the other side, it's how can we reduce our CO2 emissions, our energy consumption in the company, and we're following that up rigidly as well. We have tough targets in that, how much our energy consumption should go down, how much our CO2 emissions should go down, and that's what you can see in our annual report, and there's copies here. Yep, sorry. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, I'm Roger Moore with the John Deere Company. Hi. Uh, we're a customer of your Absolutely, very your, good uh, customer, thank you. Products. Thank you. Um, you're, you're you could packed. be a bigger customer if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, feel, no, feel free. Well, it depends on this answer. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, this is more than a million dollar question. Okay, here we go. <laughs> no, I'm seriously, getting ready. Your, your passion for your customers is terrific. Mm. Um, I, I could listen to you all morning. D tell me a little bit about uh, how you and, and your leadership team interact with the customers. Do you have some type of an executive sponsor program? Uh, how and what do you expect of your leaders mm. to integrate with the customers? Mm. We have that, and we don't have it for all of our executives, but we have it, uh, of course, myself and the business area presidents, you would expect. That's their job, to be out there with customers. But we have it for some other key people. For example, our chief technology officer, he has three customers that he interacts with at different levels there. Um, we push hard that we spend a lot of time out visiting customers, we get customers to come and see us. So when we were also in, in, in USA last year, we brought the group management team here, as we do in different parts of the world. We spent time with one of our big customers, with our strategic account manager, visiting their operations, etc. We start all of our meetings with customer as the first item on the agenda. What's happening to our customers? What's happening to our business? Uh, there. Highlights, I'm trying to get more of the lowlights into that as well because you know everything doesn't always go well, so you should look at the, the other things as well. But yeah, we, we have that sponsorship. I personally spend a huge amount of time. I travel something like 170 days a year. Uh, I visit operations, but I also visit customers and uh, suppliers as well because I always say my job's not done sitting in our corner office in the headquarter. It's keeping in touch with reality out there. It's difficult to see where you are there. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Tom. Hi. Uh, I'm Ron Davis uh, with Zurich Insurance Company. Great comments. Thanks so much. Uh, you spoke a lot about the uh, depth of the customer interaction that all of you have. Can you speak a little bit about lessons learned and about things that have gone wrong that you or other executives have identified, and how do you work in a constructive manner and use that to yeah. continue your improvement? Generally, I, I tell you, the biggest challenge we have in working with customers is that many times our people bring us in too late, as senior managers, in to interact with the customers too late uh, there, in that the peop our organization wants to manage it themselves and wants to help develop the business themselves. And when it gets to a minute to midnight, and sometimes actually a minute past midnight, uh, they want to bring us in, uh, into there. And that's why we're driving more to, to build this. And as I say, we don't have a full executive sponsorship program, but we have it across a number of uh, different uh, members of group management so that we can build that relationship up much earlier uh, with the customers. Because if you come in very late, it's difficult to solve solve issues there. Uh, so the learnings we got is we need to be much more involved and active all the time in our customers. Can, but be honest, we can do it much better. We're, we're, we're there, but we can do it much better. And that's what's exciting. It's an opportunity. You're getting lots of exercise running along there. It's excellent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer Vessels with Next Step, and I was very pleased to hear you talk about distribution, and it sounds like that remains a strategic part of your business. I'm curious, with the introduction of apps, movement towards more services, some of the sensing that you mentioned you're building into your products, where do you see the future going with distribution, channels, 
and some of the data that you're collecting. How do you see that all rolling together for the future? And that, that's a great question. Um, first of all, we, we have put um, programs in place with our distributors we call certified maintenance programs uh, where we can help train and develop them to do certain part of the service business themselves. We've given them tools to help uh, uh, them be able to justify the value that they're working. But I think we're now facing in the industrial arena, industrial distribution, one of the biggest challenges and the biggest changes uh, in business as to the role distribution will play. They have a key role to play, but if they try to do tomorrow a little bit better what they did today, that will not be enough. And we've got, and exactly what they need to do differently and what we need to do differently to support them is not 100% clear, but that dialogue is underway. And we see the need that we're going to be able to, to use the tools like apps, use smart devices, not just as apps, but also as an integral part of your service offer, I, using new technology that you can work with in iPads and uh, iPhones and, and, and Android devices, using that as a means that they can work with the information, they can collect the information, and we can provide them the, the additional competent support to do things. So I think we're facing an interesting time in industrial distribution over the next five, 10 years. Uh, and I think that, uh, as I said, they've got to change, and we've got to change as a manufacturer supporting them in distribution to take advantage of the opportunities. And if we don't, then it will, it will be a, a risk and, and we will be uh, uh, cut out of the, the business. That's not going to happen, to be clear, but, 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 but we, we can see we can do a lot more in that area. But it is changing. And, and, and as I say, doing the same tomorrow a little bit better will not be enough in distribution. Really looking at how can we harness the internet, information, etc., in the right way is what we need to do. We have time maybe for one last question. No more? There's one at the back there. There's a gentleman right there. Oh, there's no. The last one. Nick Wagner with Waters Corporation. With regards to your DSP model, uh, outside of the hard costs through discounts, what are some of the uh, drivers for that model? Oh, m many elements within there. And, and how do you pull the data? We, we have the data built up, as I said, over 47,000 cases built up. There are many different factors in that. For example, if your product lasts longer, if your product uses less energy, if your product loses less lubrication, you can put a value on that. You have to have the knowledge, but you can put a value on that. Um, and uh, actually sitting to, to your right in the orange shirt is the guy who's responsible for DSP and SKF there, um, <laughs> and driving it there as well. But, but, it's, but, but it's quantifying and looking at all these different elements. There's lots of different levers you can put in. The easiest one of all is always the one that says, you know, if my plant stops, it costs me X per hour. The different one is the operational things that you can do. And they say, how much less lubricant do you need? How much less time do you need to do the repair? How much longer can it last? You need to have that data. And we have that in our database. We didn't have it a long time ago. We have it now because of the experience we've got. When we do an asset test on a company, we can go to a plant, a petrochemical plant. We can go through an asset register there. We can see how they're performing, and we can compare that to best in class worldwide. And we know what we need to do to close the gap there. And by closing the gap, you can put a value on that. If I move you from 83% uptime to 87% uptime by doing A, B, C, D, E, this is what it will save you. That's what we do up front. We then do the contract with them if they go ahead with us. And at the end, we measure and, and benchmark against them. That data then goes back into our database. We never tell these guys who the other companies are. We use it as a, an anonymous database, but we can, sh we can see the data that works there. So there's many different elements in there. It depends on the customer who you're working with there. It can be the plant manager, the maintenance manager. It can be, it can be a variety of different. It can be the managing director in the customer. Uh, but it's got to be in that area there that look at it, because they're the ones who really it's important for them the uptime, the, the, the reduced energy consumption uh, that you can do. I mean, for example, we have solutions that can reduce your energy consumed to, to have the same output because of the lubricant we use, the seal we use, etc. You can put a value on that. You can put a value on the output there with it, and then you can quantify that value uh, for the customer.
One of the things, just one last point, one of the things I'm doing with our own purchasing organization just now is I'm measuring our purchasing organization and I'm going to incentivize them on reducing my total cost of ownership, moving it away from the purchasing being uh, incentivized on price. I need you to reduce my total cost of ownership uh, there. Is it easy? No, but we're getting there. Sorry. Thank you. Tom, uh, you, Thank you. you have combined passion, vision, and pragmatism. Those are tremendous qualities of a great CEO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your time. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you.